Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Collier's International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handrow Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsinelli, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Marinkoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. You know what kills people? More people die from the opioid epidemic than from auto accidents. This is the problem that we have in the country. And this problem has to be explained to the population. And today, in a two-part Stoller report, we're going to discuss the epidemic in the opioids. My guests are going to introduce each one of themselves. Hi, um, my name is Elaine Pozicki, and I am co-chair of the Partnership for Drug-Free New Jersey. And? And I have a, a nonprofit called Prevent Opiate Abuse, and it's just to give the public information as to the dangers of taking opioid pain medication. Andrew. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Kolodny. I'm the co-director of the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative at Brandeis University. And I'm also a co-founder and the director of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. Our prosecutor. Hi, Michael. Joe Coronado. I'm the Ocean County Prosecutor. Angelo Valente. I'm the executive director of the Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey. I am Steve Whitkoff. Um, I'm here today because I lost my son, Andrew, to a opioid overdose on August 14th, 2011. Everybody's been touched by opioids in this room in a certain way. They've seen it or they've heard of it. What are we doing to prevent this? I mean, the state of New Jersey has taken major in initiatives, right? You were yes. Saying, yes. The newest programs, Christie's, put through a number of them. Um, Governor Christie signed 21 bills that uh, that is going to protect our our country and our state from, um, from opiate abuse. Uh, one of them is the notification bill, which we are very proud that he signed because we at the partnership feel that this is a very good first step into addressing our, our epidemic 
and and it starts at the grassroots where the they are actually going to be getting the prescription from a doctor, a nurse, or uh, a, a practitioner that's a, that's able to uh, prescribe this. And what they're going to what what happens in this bill is that the prescriber has to explain to the patient or the pa- or the parents of a patient that what he is about to prescribe is addicting and that there is an alternative to an opioid and that he is to explain what that would be and it has to be marked down in their chart um, we would love to see this go nationwide because we feel that it is the first step in prevention. Since, since you're involved on a nationwide situation, how are we trying to take care of this epidemic? So, you know, uh, to talk about solutions or strategies for controlling the problem, I think it's good to really define the problem. Let's define the and, problem. And, uh, you know, I would define our opioid crisis as an epidemic of opioid addiction And what I mean by that is that the reason that the United States is experiencing historically high levels of overdose deaths and the reason we're seeing heroin and fentanyl flood into non-urban areas, the reason we're seeing a soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent, children winding up in the foster care system, outbreaks of injection related infectious diseases, the driver behind all of these health and social problems has been a very large increase in the number of Americans suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. We've seen a 900% increase since 1997, and it's this increase in addiction that's led to the crisis. So this increase in addiction, is it caused due to the physicians prescribing too much? Is it caused due to the pharmaceutical companies who are making outrageous sums? So the CDC has been very clear about the cause of our epidemic. And what they've shown very nicely with with data is that as the prescribing of opioids began to soar, uh, beginning in the mid-90s, that as that prescribing went up, rates of addiction and overdose deaths went up right along with the increase in prescribing the reason that the medical community started to prescribe opioids so much more aggressively has a lot to do with pharmaceutical company marketing. In the mid-90s, when Purdue Pharma launched OxyContin, it released that drug with a brilliant marketing campaign that misinformed the medical community. Starting in the mid-90s, doctors begin hearing that we had been under-prescribing opioids, allowing patients to suffer needlessly. We begin hearing that the risk of addiction had been overblown. The statistic that was used was much less than 1% of your patients will ever get addicted. And we didn't just hear this directly from the drug company. We began hearing it from our professional societies, from pain specialists eminent in the field of pain medicine. We heard it from our hospitals. We heard it from the Joint Commission which regulates hospitals. We heard it from our state medical boards. From every different direction, you begin hearing that if you're an enlightened, compassionate physician, you'll be different from those stingy, puritanical doctors of the past who are letting people suffer. You'll understand that opioids are a gift from Mother Nature and should be prescribed much more liberally. As we responded to this brilliant campaign and the prescribing took off, it led to a public health catastrophe. Our public health cat- catastrophe is predominantly in the white community, right? Why is it happening in the white community? Well, it's, I believe it's all driven by prescription pills, and I think that the white community has better access to prescription pills and prescription plans. Uh, when I became prosecutor four years ago, um, it was within the first week of becoming prosecutor, I had eight overdose deaths in seven days, I had one young girl, um, uh, a blonde girl in brick, who was 18 years old, who died in a motel room, who was doing 50 packs of heroin a day, 25 in the morning and 25 at night. I realized this at, at that point in time, I, was, I wasn't sure what I had gotten myself into. When, when I look at the numbers in Ocean County, uh, back in 2012, we had 56 people dying from heroin overdoses. In 2013, we had 112. 
in 2014 and went down to 101 because we started using Narcan. But then in 2015, went up to 118. And now we're up to uh, 2016. It was 209 uh, deaths in Ocean County. And I think the doctor hit the nail on the head in the sense that it's not only heroin anymore, it's fentanyl. Yeah, but to answer your question about why it's so white, I, I think that's absolutely right. It has to do with exposure. Something that's been studied uh, and proven over and over again is that if a patient is black, the doctor prescribes narcotics much more cautiously. It would seem if the patient is black, the doctor may be more worried about the patient getting addicted, or maybe they're more worried about the patient selling their pills. And if the patient is white, they're prescribing as if there's nothing to be concerned about. What I think may be happening is that racial stereotyping is having a protective effect on non-white populations. Why are the newspapers today promoting more discussions on this? Well, I think what's happening is that every neighborhood and every community is being impacted. There's not a family or a community that hasn't been impacted by this disease that we have in the epidemic. So I think that that stigma that might have been what many people might have been dealing with uh, for many years is really starting to break down. And we're starting to understand that this is a disease like any other disease. And we have to treat the disease. We have to be able to support those that need support. But most importantly, we have, it's a cultural change as well. We have to understand that we're changing the way the medicine field is, is involved in this, and certainly we need to get everyone but involved. The, the access, the, okay, your son started this, uh, did he have an accident? I know your son had a sports accident. My son had a rotator cuff operation and was given Oxycontin, and after the operation they gave him extra for his physical rehabilitation. And um, after he finished, it was at that, he finished the pills, it was at that time that he became addicted. What about your son? No, my son, I think, star um, took Oxy for the first time, Michael, in his freshman year of college when he joined a fraternity. And I think they got it from a pill mill in a, a he was so a, so as a, a, the peer pressure it was more of a peer pressure no doubt and um you know i remember the first time that he called me and told me he had a problem i was telling you before he he detoxed in a in, in a bed with me i mean with a with a hundred five fever because he um he, he he was in full withdrawal from it so but I would have never, I was as surprised as anybody because I just would have never expected that my son would have gravitated towards that. I, I think people just don't have the fear that they should of how destructive this drug is. It, it, it is the killer. It kills. So th th that's exactly right. You know, there was a, a time, certainly when I was in, in college, um, if drugs came around, if someone brought heroin to a party, you would look at them like they were crazy. If they brought marijuana, maybe you'd use it, maybe you wouldn't. But you made a determination about what's a soft drug or what's a hard drug. And young people don't always uh, do a good job of evaluating risk, but they, they did a fair job. Many of the young people who are now heroin users, it began with prescription opioids, and they, they made the mistake of thinking of a prescription opioid as a soft drug. It was prescribed by a doctor, maybe it was in mom's medicine chest, and it's not until after they become addicted that many of them recognize that it's the same thing as heroin. It really does produce the same effect. These two stories, by the way, are really the way most young people are getting addicted. It's really either through medical use, through recreational use, or sometimes a combination where there's a brief medical so, exposure so followed by the recreational legalization use. of marijuana. What, what effect does that have? I, I mean, it's not legal in New Jersey, it's not legal in New York, but I believe it's legal in Massachusetts now, Colorado. Well, I think there's all kinds of complications once you legalize marijuana. And in my opinion, I think if you're going to legalize marijuana, I'm not suggesting that you do, but if you are, you certainly need to come up with a hard and fast number where the person is under the influence uh, under the influence of that particular drug. And unless you come up with an analytical number 
that you could say that just like they do with alcohol being 0.08 or 0.10, then I think you need to do the same thing with marijuana because other than that, you're going to have problems. You're going to have accidents. People are going to be smoking. I, the way I look at it is that, you know, are you going to want your, your um, teachers uh, to, to party the night before they go before they're teaching your child in school the next day do you want your nurses do you want your physicians do you want your bus drivers do you want your taxi taxi drivers the bottom line is that if you're going to legalize marijuana I, I foresee in my crystal ball that there's going to be more testing urine testing and, and, and drug testing voluntary or at least contractually uh, testing to make sure that those individuals are not under the influence while they're operating or performing their tasks well what is the position of the state of New Jersey today with regard to uh, recreational uh... Uh, I think at this point in time the legislature is looking at several bills but uh, they have not passed any bills that would legalize marijuana at this point. But, you know, look, at, the bottom line is marijuana is a little bit different. This, it stays in the system a lot longer than, than, than the other drugs that you have. So the fact is that you can test somebody and they could still have it, but they could have, they could have smoked it maybe three weeks ago or four weeks it's ago. It's not even the smoking today. Today in, in, in Colorado, it's the edibles. Absolutely. The, the edibles have a, a worse effect because they, they really don't have a potency. We, we had just arrested about, about a year ago a marijuana dealer in Ocean County. What got me concerned about it is that he was taking the stems of the plants, reducing them into an oil, and then uh, making them into Jolly Rancher candy and selling them uh, to, the, uh, to the students in the school. And at that point in time, it became you know, readily unconscionable for us not to, not to, um, you know, to arrest that individual. So the, the fact is, is that, that it was huge profit in it for him to be able to do that. But the toll that it was taking both on the, both to, on the younger generation and in our future, I think is, is unconscionable in the sense that, that the edibles and, and it's just not, like you said, Mike, the smoking of the, of the joint. Right. Well, here, here's the question. Uh, it happened to your son, may have happened to your son, but a lot of these, you start with Oxycontin or another narcotic, okay? And then you, you go to heroin. Uh, as I was reading in these articles, it said because heroin is the low-cost drug that you can get at a cheap price, and then you can also get it on the Internet. How do people learn about this? So the, it, it's important to understand we actually have two groups of Americans who are opioid addicted, an older group and a younger group. The older group are people in their 40s up through their 80s and 90s. The older group is developing their opioid addiction almost entirely through medical treatment. And the older group is not switching to heroin. Even after they become addicted, they generally don't have a hard time finding doctors who will continue them on a large quantity and up until very recently we've actually seen many more deaths in the older group that gets pills more easily from doctors. The younger group is the group that's been switching to heroin. It's people in their 20s and 30s. They're developing their opioid addiction either through medical use or recreational use or sometimes a combination. The older group, once they get addicted, they have a hard time maintaining their supply visiting doctors and it's not that Doctors and dentists don't want to give young people lots of pills. Unfortunately, we're too comfortable doing that. But doctors don't like to give healthy-looking 25-year-olds a large quantity on a monthly basis. So the young person who's addicted and now needs to maintain their supply, and once you're addicted, you're not using because it's fun. You're using because you have to keep using to avoid feeling awful. That younger group winds up on the black market. The pills are very expensive on the black market. So as you said, they're switching because heroin is cheaper. And what we've seen happen over the past 20 years as the epidemic has gotten worse, we've seen heroin move into more regions of the country where it wasn't previously available to meet the demand for it by this growing number of young people who are opioid addicted. Starting in around 2011, the heroin supply became much more dangerous. Increasingly, it has another drug, fentanyl, mixed into it, which is many times more potent, about 50 times more potent than heroin. And, uh, and in some cases, fentanyl is being sold as heroin. And uh, since 2011, in this younger heroin-using group, we've seen an enormous increase, a skyrocketing in overdose deaths, which is causing the overall where, problem where to get worse. Where is this heroin coming from? Well, the heroin... Um 
usually, at least in New Jersey, by us, is coming by way of Mexico. That's where, there, where most of our heroin, I, the biggest um, maker of heroin, I guess, is Afghanistan uh, for, for around the world. But the, the, the heroin that we're getting, according to the DEA, here in New Jersey and New York, uh, pretty much is through, uh, through Mexico. But I think the doctor hit the nail on the head, and that is it's all about money. And, and when you can't afford the prescription pills and they're costing you $25. So what, about, what about these lawsuits that uh, took place a couple of years ago uh, that was brought upon to Purdue Farmer? And they, they, there was $630 million was the settlement. So that lawsuit uh, focused on the specific ways that Purdue Pharma promoted Marketing promoted OxyContin. It was a misbranding suit. And because Purdue got into trouble for promoting the OxyContin formulation as less addictive, they weren't able to continue making some of the same claims about OxyContin after that litigation. But that litigation missed the bulk of what Purdue had done to cause our epidemic. And because it didn't really get at the, the, the root of the problem, Purdue was able to continue promoting opioids in, in the same way that they had. What really led to this epidemic wasn't the way in which they promoted OxyContin specifically. It was the non-branded aspects of their campaign. It was convincing the medical community to feel comfortable with opioids as a class of drug. They benefited the most from the change in practice because they had the new branded product. But the, the worst thing that they did was to make doctors feel that opioids are not really addictive and that they're effective for daily long-term use. So how do we educate the doctors today? Well, we in New Jersey have started a series called Do No Harm. And what we do is we bring together the medical community uh, along with experts in the field and we share with them uh, research. We share with them information. We share with them personal stories. And what we found, and we've educated about 3,000 physicians and dentists over the last several years, is that 90% of those in attendance discuss the fact that after they've completed this program, that they're going, to, they're going to change their prescribing habits. So we know that in many cases, doctors are just not aware. They're not aware about the serious and, in many cases, uh, deadly consequences of, of what they're prescribing. What is this new rule uh, with regard to the number of days that they can prescribe? Uh, that, that was part of a, a package that was um, uh, passed by the legislature in New Jersey and, and signed into law by the governor. And what it does is it limits the first prescription to five days uh, for an opioid in the state for acute pain. It also requires doctors to take a continuing medical ed education credit each year. And what it also does is it gives people access to uh, treatment uh, without having to go through a whole process. Uh, once they need treatment, if they're covered by insurance in the state of New Jersey, they're going to be, get, be able to get access to that treatment. And finally, what it does is it forces the pres prescriber, whether it be a doctor or a dentist, to have a conversation with so, the patient. So here's a double question. Uh, as I was saying, you have emergency rooms, you have urgent care centers. You have all of the situation over there. And I'm going to, because you're an active citizen in the community, Steve, how are you, because I know you always get involved, how are you trying to emphasize the problems that we're having with the opioids epidemic to legislators and friends in New York State? Well, in my son's case, he was clean for nine months, and then he was connected to a drug dealer by a website in the United States owned by three major United States corporations and this website is now protected by the Internet Communications Act so to me this 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 pandemic this epidemic whatever we're gonna call it it has so many dimensions to it it's about the treatment it's about grief control for the wreckage that gets left behind for families like mine and mm -hmm. Elaine's it's it's about U.S. corporations that back websites where opioid dealers are put together on, and this is not the dark web, not a Silk Roads case. This is the real web protected by a congressional act called the Internet Communications Act. So there's so much to be done in the field, and it's just beginning. And that's part of the reason why I think everybody was, was enthused to come here today, because 
it needs to be talked about. It's New Jersey is very proactive. Why aren't the other states? In all my readings, I don't see too many states really being that proactive. We're, we're starting to. Um, I think that for many years, and not just state governments, but especially the federal government, really neglected this problem. President Obama, I think, did an awful job. He really uh, paid no attention to the crisis until his last year in office. Up until his last year in office, he didn't seek funding for the problem, didn't speak about it publicly. In his last year, he did start to do some of the the right things. In fact, I, I think that President Obama's response to the opioid crisis uh, in many ways was similar to Ronald Reagan's response to the AIDS epidemic because Ronald Reagan also didn't speak about that problem, didn't want to say AIDS publicly until his last year in office. And many p- people believe if Reagan had acted more forcefully to the AIDS epidemic, it might not have gotten as bad as it did. So, you know, there's been really a neglect of the problem. What we have seen from the federal government were many of the wrong things. So the focus for the first 15 years that this problem began to be identified was on stopping so-called non-medical use or abuse. If you look at the publications that were coming out of the federal agencies that that tackle uh, drug abuse, it was all focused on stopping kids from getting into grandma's medicine chest. The idea was that the issue is we've got some people who want to abuse these drugs, but we've got millions of people with pain who need them, and let's not do anything that would result in less prescribing because that would punish the pain patients for the bad behavior of the drug but, abusers. But no one was looking but, at the fact you, that there was you, overprescription. You brought up a very interesting topic with regard to the medicine chest. Uh, with with all the research, it does say that many people get hooked on this because they were prescribed in the past. They may be in the medicine chest. The younger adult sees it and, and they take the pill. They get stuck and they become a, an addict. So, well, that, the issue, the, the focus was on kids getting into the grandma's medicine chest, but nobody was really asking why does every grandma now have it in her medicine chest? Why are the doctors overprescribing? And now you're starting to see states and the federal government begin to pay attention to the overprescribing. It all starts with our children. When they get sick, we take them to the doctor, and we always want to get them a pill to make them feel better. No matter what it is, there's a magic pill that's going to solve the problem. And then when you have doctors prescribing 30 days supply of Oxycontin, Percocets, Vicodin, and it sits in the cabinet. It's not a big deal for a kid to go in and take four or five pills. Nobody counts the amount of pills that's that's in the cabinet. And when they can sell it in the school for $20 a pill, then before you know it, they become unwittingly a, a drug dealer. And once they lose that supply, then they go to grandma and grandpa's house and they go over the friend's house and they look in the medicine cabinets and they're and they're taking one or two pills. The bottom line is is that we as a society, the family is being attacked here, and that's why I think that I think that the government needs to take a look at this a lot harder. So next week, we're going to continue the discussion. We could talk about the dark web. We're going to talk about the, the centers which are allegedly taking care of these people for rehab and not doing a good job. Now, I'd just like to thank Elaine, Andrew, Joe, Angelo, and Steve. We'll be back next week.